it's on. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, new webinar for the Credit Series webinars. Uh, today we are having an interesting talk. Uh, we're all looking forward to, to the talk today with um, Fatima, who is, um, Fatima is, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a, a little bit of introduction about Fatima, who is a enthusiast uh, in uh, art and architecture and enthusiast. And she has a bachelor's in science of architectural engineering from the University of Sharjah. And she's currently completing her master's degree from the uni same university in uh, conservation management of cultural heritage in management of heritage sites. Um, her dissertation focuses on heritage identification and valuation of Dubai's modern architecture. Fatima also works as an assistant project manager in the Ministry of Culture and Youth, and she's lead researcher on Ras Al Khaimah Modern Heritage Study. I'm personally looking forward to, um, to this talk, as everyone here who joined us looking forward to this. I'm just going to remind um, the audience or and going to remind everyone who joined us. If you have any question, please use the Q&A section to type in your questions, and then I'll be directing these questions to Fatima once she's done with the uh, presentation. Um, that's all from my side for now, uh, Fatima, and then we come back at the end of the talk. So. Um, the stage is yours, Fatima, to go ahead and, and start you. your interesting talk. Thank you, Mahanda. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cred team, for inviting me to Dr. George and Mahanda for doing this. Um, I'm really actually excited to be uh, presenting today uh, UAE's Modern Heritage. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, okay. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, UAE's modern heritage, um, a research on the case of Dubai as part, as you said, as part of my uh, master's dissertation and as um, at the case of Ras Al Khaimah as part of a research ongoing in the Ministry of Culture and Youth. So at the beginning, I would just like to emphasize and say that I'm not an expert on the field. I'm just um, a researcher. And so what I'm going to be presenting, presenting today is the progress of the research, more of the observations and more actually questions than answers or conclusions. So um, as a master's student in conservation of uh, culture heritage, I have always, uh, and also as an architecture student before that, I have always noticed a gap in the modern history of the Gulf or um, in UAE specifically. And living in Dubai almost all of my life, I have been noticing the change in the built environment, how some buildings are simply demolished and replaced by newer buildings and as if nothing was ever there. And this actually just increased my interest in, the, in this topic specifically. So what we see usually is al Bastakiya, which was built before, and then Burj Khalifa. So my question is, what happened between Bastakiya and Burj Khalifa? What happened in that period? So um, talking about modern heritage, what is modern heritage? Um, usually when we say the word modern, it reminds us of uh, modernity or modern architecture, which is a an architecture style that emerged in the 20th century uh, in Europe, um, which focused on on functionalism or full form follows function, function or uh, minimalism and the use uh, um, the rejection of ornaments and uh, also the the use of new materials, new technology like steel structure, reinforced concrete. So, uh, but what is modern heritage? Now that we have attached the word heritage into it, it becomes something that calls, that automatically calls for preservation and conservation. It becomes something like any type of heritage, whether it's historical or vernacular, and we need to protect it. So this actually what led to, uh, to the definition of modern heritage, it is very simple. It is the architecture, town planning, and landscape design of the 19th and 20th century. But as I said, since it's heritage, it, it makes you think of, it adds more variables to the equation, like the, uh, the values. We need to look at values that will help us preserve this heritage, uh, whether it's historical or political or social value. 
And this actually make us look beyond the architecture, beyond the aesthetics of the structures. Um, and uh, so that's actually what led to the international movement uh, and increasing awareness in protection uh, of this modern heritage since uh, actually 1989. Um, initiatives and uh, many organizations have emerged like the Getty initiative to conserve modern architecture or the Ecomos committee of the 20th uh, century heritage and many other local national and international organizations that not only aim to uh, study how can we conserve this new materials uh, of concrete and steel but also to try to understand this phase um, and how did it affect different regions, not just the US or the UK? Um, so allow me to read this quote. Um, UNESCO World Heritage emphasizes how modernity engulfed the world in a pioneering period in Europe. Each region reacted differently to this process, resulting in the regional expressions and nuances, which were enhanced by the cultural isolation that occurred because of the Second World War. Eventually, these different expressions had an impact again on the region of origin, creating a complex pattern of fertilization and cross-fertilization. So knowing this, it actually makes you think, what is modern heritage when it comes to the Gulf region or to the UAE in specific? And how did it affect uh, the cities in, in the UAE, like Dubai and Ras al Khaimah, in which we will present today? So starting with Dubai, as most Gulf states in the Middle East, the modern urban renaissance of Dubai did not begin until a decade after the Second World War. The earliest recorded socio-economic history of Dubai began as an insignificant fishing village sometime during the 18th century. Up until the 19th century, the small fishing village has witnessed change in its political and social setting when it was inhabited by Al Maktoum uh, family. Uh, specifically in a Shindaga area in which we can see over here, sorry, in this side. Um, so um, where, where the family established a dynasty of al Maktoum rulers of Dubai. So just like any other coastal town of the Western Trucial states, Dubai being a town close to the sea had similar features in common and that is the specifically the creek um, however, Dubai had the exception that uh, an advantage that its creek uh, being extended further in the land uh, than any other creek. So this waterway was an integral part to make the uh, part to Dubai's early development as a trading port. So in the 50s, there has been a rapid increase of trade and uh, influx that demanded an improved life quality for the community in terms of infrastructure, education, everyday living, and health. So it was important to establish a municipality, a proper baladia. So in 1957, the baladia was established to control construction and city. Now in this building, the baladia was uh, occupied the first floor and then underneath were like uh, stores and shops. Uh, this is the first location of the municipality and then they, they moved to other buildings. Additionally, also the city has witnessed its first hospital that was built in 1950, Al Maktoum Hospital, and it, uh, it was used up until I think the year 2000, 2001. Um, and then I'm not sure what happened to it, but I, I've heard that it's gonna be turned into a museum hopefully uh, sometime soon. Um, also, the first airport was ever built in 1959 or 1960. Now, to grow Dubai as a modern town, uh, like other cities around the world, the, a master plan was needed. So the first master plan was introduced in 1960 by, by the architect John Harris, um, which came to establish the physical framework of a modern city that addressed the fundamentals, which is um, a map, a road system, direction for growth, and introduction of land uses. And as you can see, the, the plan actually respected the old fabric of the, um, of the city. So um, also it introduced the first connection between Deira and Bar Dubai by Al Maktoum Bridge. So Al Maktoum Bridge was actually built in 1962. 
uh, to connect uh, both sides. Um, so going to the architecture of the 60s, we have the built of, sorry, the built of the Dera clock tower in 65. Uh, and also actually many internationals and corporations were attracted to build in Dubai, like trade, oil, shipping, and also hotels. Uh, we have here the Ambassador Hotel that still survives until today in Port Dubai, um, pretty close to, to, to the creek. Um, it was built in 68. And uh, also many financial institutions like the National Bank of Dubai that was built by the architect John Harris. Unfortunately, this building was demolished, but um, uh, it was also in, in Dera side by, by the creek. Um, along with eight other banks that were established uh, in the 60s. Um, one of them is the, uh, is the first uh, national city bank, uh, which structures is, is still, uh, still survives up until today. Uh, so those banks were actually attracted to venture in the city and established their footholds, stimulating new construction along the creek to be developed. Um, what was also interesting is to see this multicultural nature that uh, Dubai has always had. So we can see the construction of uh, churches. Uh, one of the churches, uh, which is the St. Mary Catholic Church was built in 67. Uh, this is an old picture of the first, uh, the first structure. However, it was replaced by a bigger one that can accommodate a, a bigger number of people. Um, and it has similar features to the old structures, but not quite the same. Um, there's also the first zoo that was built by the architect Otto Bullard, who is a lover of animals, and he, he built the zoo for himself. It was a private zoo, and then it was transferred to, to be owned by the municipality and open to the public. Unfortunately, it was shut down only a few years ago, but the structure is still, is still there. So this plan has guided Dubai's uh, modest early development until the discovery of the oil in 1966, the discovery of oil in commercial quantities. So um, it has then introduced a more ambitious master plan, also designed by John Harris in 1971. So this new plan has considered the city as a whole, including the provision of ring roads around the urban area and radial street network to, uh, to the suburbs. Uh, the plan also introduced um, a connection, another connection between Deir and Bardubai, which is the Shibdaga Tunnel, uh, which was built in 1975. So this led to an acceleration to Sheikh Rashid's infrastructure development plans and a construction boom that increased job opportunities and brought a massive influx of foreign workers, which were mainly Asians and Middle Easterns. And between the years 68 and 75, the city's population had grew by over 300%, hence um, urban growth and technological introduction. So this socio-economic transformation has directly affected the shaping of the urban landscape of Dubai, from it being um, uh, from vernacular bardis, tight neighborhoods, architecture made out of coral stone, to high-rise buildings made out of uh, reinforced concrete, steel, and glass. So uh, this transformation has actually redefined the local image of the Dubai cityscape. So um, after the introduction of this new master plan, the city witnessed tremendous construction of different building typologies like shopping malls and uh, banks and hotels, uh, which I will introduce um, shortly. Uh, but, but also actually most of the 70s um, architecture was very minimal, was very, you can say, experimental, like the uh, Sheikh Rashid uh, Hospital Mosque. Um, it was also, it was interesting to see how the regions, uh, the regions specific constraints, like the limited material availability, the narrow construction time and harsh climate has actually led architects to original ideas and technologies and procurement methods with highly inventive uh, processes. Uh, so then the need uh, was for a larger, more sophisticated um, uh, hospitals and that led to the construction of uh, Rashid Hospital um, in 1973, which was also built by John Harris. 
uh, another uh, very known hospital is the Iranian hospital. Uh, going back to the to the point of this multicultural nature in Dubai that has always been there, the hospital was built in the heart of the Persian community in Jumeirah. Uh, and as you can see, the structure is heavily inspired by Persian design and architecture. Of course, within time, uh, this design ha has been has increased actually and more buildings were built within the hospital and clinics and more contemporary additions were added. Um, as you can see, I, I prefer um, mostly to use old pictures or archival material uh, of those buildings because most of the, those buildings have undergone heavy restoration or facelifts. So um, it, it, uh, this actually helps you understand the main concept that the architect was trying to convey uh, with the material he used and the time constraint that he had. And it also shows how they were encouraged to test with, um, with materials that within time, if we see them today, were decayed and it uh, led to the need of cover-ups. And this actually helps us understand this period better in terms of, uh, of the built environment. Um, another uh, very famous building is the Burj Rashid, uh, the World Trade T Tower, uh, which was built in 74 by John Harris. Um, and then I think architects became more daring to go bigger, um, like the Bank of Baroda building, which is still there um, today. Uh, it was actually the same building of the, um, of the British Bank of the Middle East and its branch in Dubai. It also com um, compromises of uh, um, apartments and resident residential apartments. Um, and it actually has the best view of the creek. Um, there's also the Metropolitan Hotel, which was also built by John Harris. I think it was along Sheikh Zayed Road. However, now it's, it's demolished. Um, the Astoria Hotel uh, is also owned by the same owner as the Ambassador Hotel that was built 10 years before. Um, and it's actually pretty close by. Uh, there's also the Sheraton Hotel built in 1977 one of the most beautiful buildings as well as the petro petroleum uh, Dubai, uh, Dubai Petroleum Building by Victor Bisharat and the Dubai Municipality Building. Um, also the, the Safa Park Pavilion, which was actually, which was, uh, it's, it's built by Pat Patrick Gwine and it was uh, supposed to be a very luxurious restaurant that overlooks uh, a water pond. Um, unfortunately, now it's not used, but um, I think it's going to be it's going to be restored and hopefully open soon. It's, I think it's a very beautiful structure. But now, going back to the point that I made at the beginning of this presentation of how now we look at the more we look at the at the values, uh, not just the architectural or the aesthetic, but also in this um, in the social values and how. Uh, structures are valued by the community sometimes, and it's not um, it's not about how beautiful it is. So this actually applies to uh, to buildings like the Al Mullah Plaza building, uh, which was actually the first shopping mall in Dubai in seventy eight, but also uh, Al Magrudi's mall. Here I have attached an old picture of Al Magrudi. Uh, mall, but if you see it today, you're not sure, is it the same building? Was it rebuilt? And then there was an addition to the back with the square doors on the first floor um, and uh, courtyards and a cafe and other things. And, and it's actually, it, it becomes more um, beyond, beyond the architecture, beyond the aesthetics and how it looks, but more of what it means to the community of Dubai. Um, the same thing goes for uh, Nasser Laser Land, which, uh, which was like the main go-to for, for the Dubai youth and the Dubai children uh, who lived in the, during the 80s and the 90s. Uh, now when, when we come to the 80s, I think architects became more confident to build uh, bigger, taller, um, and it actually says a lot um, about um, uh, about what happened then. Was it um, the availability of material or the availability of um, expertise and, and, and how's the 
practice in the architecture and the construction field. Uh, this structure, which is the Bank of Credit and Commerce, um, I think it's a very undervalued structure, but it gives you this very um, bulky um, and uh, it kind of re reminds me of a, br a brutal structure. Um, it before it was called the Bank of Credit and Commerce, I'm not sure what, what it has um, now. There's also the Chicago Beach Hotel, which was built in 1980. Unfortunately, it was demolished on the uh, like 15 or 17 years later. Now it's in the same location as Jumeirah Beach and uh, Jumeirah Beach Resort, uh, which is next to Burj Al Arab. Uh, there's also a Masraf Tower, which I think uh, looks very similar to Burj Rashid. It was built in 1980. There's also the Gharir Shopping Center. You can see here, I have attached a picture of before and after, and you can see the renovation and restoration that was done to the building. But I also want to emphasize on the mosque that is um, at the top, uh, at the bottom right over here. Uh, I think it's obvious how I'm very fascinated with the religious buildings, whether they're churches or mosques from that period. And I think it's something that is not very, I would just love to, to get a hand on a research or a study that's done on it. It's, it's, I think it's very interesting. Um, so Al Ghrir was also very, a very significant go-to um, place for, for the people of uh, Dubai. Uh, there's also the first psychiatric hospital, uh, the first ever psychiatric hospital built in 1983, uh, designed by John Harris. Um, I think actually I have to admit that this building is the, the building that actually the demolishment of it in 2017 is what made me want to just pursue research in this in this field because um, ever ever since I was young, I would pass by this building every Friday, but I never went inside and I only got able to go inside when a week before it was demolished in 2017. And I got to look at it and to see how huge it is it never I never imagined it's this big and it actually felt more of like when you're when you're walking through it you'd feel like it feels like a community like you're walking in a neighborhood every now and then you would see those uh, small courtyards uh, walking in those uh, hallways and um, it really makes me sad that uh, lack of documentation of buildings that were uh, demolished is just I think that that's that's what what um, we need to do as researchers or architects to at least we can't save everything, but at least to document. Um, there is also Wafi Center, which uh, which is uh, very 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 popular since it was built in 1984. It's uh, known for this middle hall in the middle uh, that is topped by a glass permit roof. Um, supported by steel uh, steel trusses, and um, and it actually reminds me of the pyramid of the Louvre in Paris. What, what was interesting, just typing in the pyramid, uh, the pyramid uh, of the Louvre. It was built. This was built before the pyramid uh, in the Louvre, and I think that that to me was very very interesting. Um, there is also the Utsala Tower by Arthur Erickson built in 86 uh, with the golf ball in the top. It kind of became uh, the Salat's uh, brand all over the UAE. And the golf tower, uh, the golf, uh, sorry, the Emirates Golf Club uh, that looks like desert, um, um, desert tents. At the end, I would just like to conclude with this mosque, Ben Medea Mosque that was built in 1990. Just, I think it's, it's one of the beautiful mosques over there and, and you can't really, looking at it and passing by it, I'm not sure when it was built, but it was built in 1990 and looking at it, it felt like, um, like it was the, the, the perfect end of an era and the start and beginning of a, of a new era. It was like an in-between. So um, that, that's with Dubai. Now moving, um, to Ras Al Khaimah. Now, Ras Al Khaimah, when it comes to Ras Al Khaimah, which is of course a research done 
um, in the Ministry of Culture and Youth in collaboration with uh, Ras al Khaimah Municipality and the Department of Antiquities and Museums of Ras al Khaimah and the American University of Ras al Khaimah as well. Um, the research on it becomes just a little bit uh, difficult to try and dig the information specifically in the modern history and specifically in terms of architecture and built environment uh, to try and gain interest from the community or the government is, is quite a challenge. Um, but a little bit of history for thousands of years, Ras al Khaimah has been prominent historical site in the Gulf region, previously known as Jalfar. Uh, the city's rich culture, archaeological significance, and strate strategic location um, as a major trade route has made it uh, attractive to a continuous line of settlers from across Asia, Africa, and Europe. Uh, by the 19th century, after finding a common threat in the Ottoman Turks, the British and the Qawasim, or the Qasmi ruling family who inhabited Ras al in the since the 18th century, they have signed a general maritime treaty of 1820 under Sheikh Sultan bin Sagar al Qasmi. So, this treaty has made Ras al Khaimah a protectorate of Britain. Um, however, further expansion of the British rule eventually led, led Sheikh Sagar al Qasmi to unite Ras al Khaimah with the UAE, making it the last emirate to join the Union in 1971. Uh, so what actually happened before that period? What happened during the union and just uh, a little bit after that? In my opinion, um, there's no proof. I'm just saying this. It all started with those, post, uh, with those postage stamps. Uh, actually, just um, sometimes during your research, you would just stumble upon very interesting material. But uh, those stamps were actually used for outgoing letters uh, in 1964. They were made in 1964, and then they were used up until the union of the UAE. Um, but uh, yeah, you can see that they have pictures of Sheikh Sagar, and then Sheikh Sagar with uh, different presidents or rulers of other countries, and then the palm trees. Um, and also you can see uh, it had pictures of major international events that used to occur all around uh, the world. And it feels like it, it kind of, uh, how, it, it tells you how Ras al Khaimah was trying to put itself in the uh, global map and how um, it tells you that Ras al Khaimah was aware of what's been happening around the world. And I think that was very interesting, but Going to the architecture, uh, the construction of the 60s has witnessed construction of infrastructure or let's say more facilities to improve the life quality, like um, schools and hospitals, but they weren't very, I would say, modern, but the, the use of modern materials uh, was there, but the architecture was very minimal and simple. Uh, here is we have uh, one of the hospital, which is um, a Nakhil hospital that was built in, in that period. Um, also, um, during that period, three types of schools were established. Um, not the normal schools, but uh, business schools, industrial schools, and agriculture, or let's say farming schools. And these were built in Dubai and Sharjah and also in Ras al Khaimah. So here in 67, we can see the industrial school that was, uh, that was built then. And uh, it was actually built of natural stone with cement. The school includes 16 workshops and seven large classrooms uh, that can fit up to 50 students. Uh, the roofs were slanted, more built on a European style. Um, slanted from both sides, as you can see here. And uh, the workshops included machines, cutting machines that were used uh, using diesel and scientific laboratories. Uh, the school was under British administration. It taught electricity, mechanics, carpentry, and welding. And it actually, um, it was actually uh, working up until it was shut down in 2005. Um, also, actually, what, what's uh, what's very um, what's very nice about Ras al Khaimah is that 
most of the structures still survive until today in their exact same condition, exact same materials. I mean, that's how it looked like back in 67 and up until today. Of course, more structures were added, but no cover-ups or restorations have, have been made. Um, and it actually supports the research. Um, um, and yeah, as I said, of course, schools in Ras al-Khaimah existed uh, since the 40s and even before that, but modern schools were not built uh, up until 69 when the first uh, modern high school was built um, in Ras al-Khaimah. It was called Sabahiya Secondary School. And uh, Sabahiya as, uh, refers to a Sabah family, which is a, uh, the Kuwaiti uh, ruling family. And uh, so the school was actually built by the Kuwaiti government. And it was actually the only high school for the next, it would be the only high school for the next 15 years. Um, it's quite a large building and it's, um, its architecture is uh, the same as the governmental uh, schools that will that were built uh, later on with the with the classroom surrounding the inner courtyard and in between there is a, there is a cor an open corridor more like a, a Liwan. Um, the finishing of the building as you can see is very plain however what i really found um, interesting is the colorful ceramics that you would see on freestanding columns. So there's one column that is not connected on any side. You would see those colorful ceramics and it was the only, it's the only colorful element in the, in the whole school. And this actually applies to all of the, of the columns in the building like these. The, the school is under restoration. I'm not sure if it's still gonna be a school or something else. But you see most of the architecture of the 60s uh, look very uh, quite, have this quite modest structures like the first cinema, the Gulf cinema on the left and the media office on the right. And that was because it was not built by concrete. I think it was built by like a mixture of cement. And uh, sometimes this mixture would be mixed with the salt water and water from the sea. And that's why most of these buildings did not actually make it until today and they were demolished. Um, uh, there's the British Bank of the Middle East has, it has established its branch in Ras al Khema. It is right in the heart of the old town. Um, as you can see, this is a picture from the seventies and here we have a picture from September 2000 and <laughs> 2020. It, it's the same exact structure. It has not been changed, although, although it's, a part of it, I think, from the inside is still used as a, like a gold factory, but it's in a very poor condition that calls for restoration. Uh, this is the Department of Electricity. Um, how it's, it has been demolished now, it's not used. And there is also the Gulf Cinema, uh, which I think is in the same location as the first cinema that I showed you, the one from the 60s. Uh, but this one still survives until today and it's under restoration. So after joining the UAE in 75, uh, sorry, in uh, 72, uh, the government of Ras al Khaimah to, uh, decided to have a proper master plan. You see, until 75, Ras al Khaimah did not have a master plan. So they invited Dar al Handasa office to do a study and to propose a plan for the next 25 years. So the study, it was an extensive study that was done on the city and it included the geography, the geology, the population, uh, the land use, the economic situation, the education situation, literally everything, um, which helped them understand where the city is going and where is it exactly growing and its direction of growth to help them propose, uh, propose a master plan. Now, unfortunately, I was not able to propose to, um, to attach the master plan, but um, you can see here from the, the arrows, um, this is the old town um, of Ras al Khaima and the direction of growth were, was towards the left and then from Iriel, it goes deeper and deeper inland. So what Dar al-Hadassah did, they actually proposed a master plan for what they called 
راس الخيمة الجديدة or the new راس الخيمة and it was uh, a plan for this area for Nakhil and beyond. Um, they proposed the main roads, the roads in between the neighborhood, the land uses and so on. So, but unfortunately, the, this plan was not fully implemented. Some roads were implemented, but actually not everything. Um, also, uh, what's different about Ras al Khaimah, what's different about Ras al Khaimah in Dubai is that also most of the, um, is that after the union of the UAE, most of the structures will be, were built by the federal government in which are recognizable by the similar features that they have in common that you can see uh, from uh, in different Emirates. And they were actually issued by Sheikh Rashid. Uh, and that includes cultural institutions or sports stadiums and clubs, uh, schools, kindergartens, uh, and sometimes uh, sh shabiat houses, neighborhoods. Um, so some examples, uh, we have the Khalifa bin Zayed Stadium, which was built in the 70s. We have Al-Wurud Kindergarten, which is a prototype of kindergartens uh, designed by Jafar Tokan. And you can see, you can see this, uh, this prototype in, in all of the Emirates, actually. The first airport was also built in 1976. And some hotels like uh, Ras Al Khaima Hotel, uh, the Garden Inn Hotel, of course, all of these hotels have been uh, undergone uh, re heavy restoration, but they are still used until today. Also a very famous or let's say significant structure is the Bruce Lee building um, uh, that is uh, in the old town of Ras Al Khaima. Um, there are actually two stories how it was named. The first one is that um, by one account, there was a gym in the building which had a poster of Bruce Lee. But um, in another story, which I think the true one, actually the one that I actually heard, it's a corruption of the Bruce City, uh, which is a Kuwaiti family that infested a fair amount of money in Ras Al Khaima, Ras Al Khaima's real estate at the time. Um, it's a large building, it's a very long, it's, uh, it has six stories, but uh, what's interesting is that it's big because it actually used all the land area that it was given. Um, so yeah, finally, in the end, I think there are many, many very interesting buildings on Ras Al Khaimah uh, and facades that, um, that it's beneficial to study them because they have not been restored. But unfortunately, lack of information can be a, a great challenge. Um, so yeah, in the end, I would just like to say that research is a continuing, continuous learning process. Never think that the information you get is 100% correct, and there's, there's always more to it. Uh, but you see, research on modern heritage in specific can be very challenging in terms of trying to dig the information, in terms of trying to uh, get interest from the community or the government or, um, and, and also I think internationally, modern architecture or modern heritage has always been overlooked because it's, it's usually perceived by people as ugly or as old. And uh, sometimes it's a reminder of a colonial time that they would just try to forget, therefore, demolish. Uh, but most of all, I think lack of research is what is the, is the great setback. And research is actually what supports the conservation practice, the government policy, policymakers. And in my opinion, it is the core of heritage preservation. And as architects and as researchers, I think that is the least we can do. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Fatma, for the interesting uh, presentation. Um, I felt that um, I went in a, in a museum tour a bit, and <laughs> it was very interesting to see to see all of these to take us back and see the history of of the Dubai and Ras Khaimah. I think that was an interesting. I'm sure everyone um, enjoyed the presentation. I see that some comments 
have, have started to come in thanking you for the amazing presentation. And of course, I do agree with these comments. Uh, with, starting with, with one question, uh, Fatma, um, what, hap what happens with these abandoned uh, buildings, especially the zoo and the, uh, the building in, in Asafa Park? It actually depends mostly on the owners, like who owns this building and what it, what they want to do and what's mostly beneficial. Is it is preserving it going to be, usually it's the issue with the economic, um, uh, this issue is more about the economics and the, uh, what are they going to get if they preserve it or if they demolish it. And um, there's no policy that protects them. There's no policy and it's not, it's not an issue in the UAE only. In many countries, there's no policy that, that protects these buildings. So it's just easy to demolish. But I think most of all is the lack of awareness. So that's yeah. and, and this takes me to, um, to the next question. Since you have, um, you showed us a lot of interesting buildings when we talk about the history, which one is your favorite one and why? <laughs> um, I would say <laughs> there are a lot of favorites, honestly, but one of my favorites is the Sheikh Rashid uh, uh, Hospital Mosque, the one that is kind of like a spaceship. Um, I think the, the structure is just very minimal and white and neat and clean, and um, I like that. I'm seeing that it was built uh, that it's very old, I think, uh, makes me love it even more. All right, I see. I see a, a comment here in the Q and A section, thanking you for the presentation and and um, suggesting that you would share or raise these concepts with the uh, relevant authorities, um, maybe the Ministry of Culture and and uh, in Dubai. Um, I also have another question here. Um, someone is asking, how can how can we begin to grant uh, support for uh, research efforts. Sorry, can you repeat that? How can we, how can we get the support for research efforts? How can we get the, the support? Like, um, uh, I don't understand the question. Like from if the- someone, If someone is, if, if someone decided to, uh, to go for um, a research, to start a research in, in the same field, how would they, find the support? How would they look for the support if they if they are looking for support? Maybe they mean get funding or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure where the funding comes from. It's not something that I have looked at uh, in specific, but I think like here at the Ministry of Culture, uh, we have uh, launched the architecture initiative back in 2019 that actually supports uh, the research on modern heritage in specific. And uh, I mean, a great example is the Ras al Khaimah research, which is done in the, in the Ministry of Culture with the, with the collaboration of the, uh, the governmental institutions in Ras al Khaimah. Um, this takes me to the next question. Uh, excellent research, um, Fatima. And what are the, the, uh, the key targets for this research? The, the first key, the first, I think, key target is to raise awareness on this uh, type of, uh, on this actually period of history, but also in this type of heritage or architecture. And uh, when it comes to Dubai, I would say it's usually overlooked. It's always al Bastakiya or Burj Khalifa. There's no, um, no one knows actually what happened in between. And the target, of course, um, the, the, the last target is to, uh, to improve uh, the policies on the conservation practice uh, of this heritage. Um, the next question is, what kind of, of a job should, should the architect seek or the student seek if they want to work in the field of architectural documentation and uh, reservation? Um, what is the kind of job? Um, they are there's interested, interested in, in working on, on a field that's similar to what you're doing. And, and, and clearly they are very interested in what you showed them. So maybe they, and this is the, that question is what, from one of our students. So um, <laughs> yeah, just to have a vision of what job, what, what, what kind of a job they should get to, uh, to follow the same or to be in the same field. 
Um, actually, I think, I'm not sure of what the type of jobs, but some uh, institutions and organizations could, you could go for an international organization. Uh, like we have the Ikram Athar, which is based in, in um, Sharjah. It's an, uh, it's an uh, organization under uh, UNESCO, which is all about heritage and preservation and conservation, but it's specific to the, to the uh, Arab region. Uh, there's also Dokomomo, they are based uh, the the Arab um, the Arab is located in Kuwait. But um, also of course, in, in, since I'm aware more of the governmental um, sector, uh, in municipalities there's always this uh, heritage uh, department that you can always go to that is specific to heritage and historical preservation and conservation in the city that they're in. Thank you, Fatma. And the next, the next question is, since most of the buildings you showed were designed by architects that come from outside of the region, so how would this shape or influence this, the future of the architectural identity for the Emirati ar architects? Now, this, uh, for this question, I think I have not investigated it enough. I'm mostly, uh, it's not mostly about the architect, but um, uh, there are many, many, I think, um, I don't know, aspects that have affected the architecture. So, uh, and when we talk about identity, it's something that uh, still, I think it's very negotiable. It's, uh, personally, I have not gone to, to that side. So, uh, but you I don't see, Fatima, to... Fatima, at the beginning, uh, you said that you were not uh, an expert, but I disagree with you on that. The way you <laughs> presented, you know, and, and the information you provided us was amazing. That's why you see, you know, a lot of uh, 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 people are asking questions and, you know, they, they're asking you and from an expert point of view. So <laughs> that's why you're getting all these questions. So go ahead, please continue. Thank you. I, actually, I, I said I'm not an expert, but I think I'm a very curious researcher, and that is what, what led me. No, what you showed is really fantastic. It's very well documented and very well you know, put. So please go ahead, Mohanan. And, and I think, yes, I, I think th that you, having the idea that you are not an expert will always give you this very good quality of work, that you are working more to be an ex expert. So we would benefit from maybe lo looking at your work later on again and, and see this amazing presentation. Um, the next, the next comment is thanking you for, again for the amazing presentation. And I have a question from the chair of the department, uh, Dr. Anna. So um, she's, she's asking you, do you think uh, UAE will or should join any architecture and inter sorry, any uh, international associations for conservation for, of modern heritage such as uh, Dokumomo? I think yes, of course, it definitely should, but it's a matter of time and experience. Um, once the UAE is ready, I think it should uh, it should join such international organizations definitely. Uh, thanks, Fatima. The, the next the next uh, question is where can we find documentation and research that is open for the public to, uh, uh, for example, libraries or digital uh, database. Actually, uh, there are very prominent uh, publications and documentations. There is a recent book by Todd Rees, which is. Uh, Shopee City, it's about uh, Dubai. There's also the documentation and research done for the Venice Binali back in 2014 mm -hmm. by Salam al Hamdan Foundation, lest we forget. There's also uh, many researchers, of course, like uh, Sultan al Saud al Qasimi, uh, Adina Hampel, um, Todd Rees, as I said. Uh, there's also there is also actually a book coming about Sharjah by by uh, Safas Al Qasimi, and uh, there is also a book um, about modern architecture of Abu Dhabi done by the New York University uh, students. Um, what else? Um, that that's what's on the top of my head right now. I can always share it. By the way, I can always share it with you, and you can share it with others. Perfect. I can see Sultan putting a heart. Thank you so much. Perfect. Uh, the last question for now. Um, why did you choose Ras al Khaimah um, and what, not other city like such as Fujaira, for example? Uh, so this is a research done in the Ministry of Culture and it was not my choice. Actually, it was a project that is presented by Dr. Iman Laasi from the American University of uh, Ras al Khaimah. 
And when I joined the ministry, I just took, took the project as a researcher. But for me personally, it will not stop. Hopefully, it will not stop on Dubai and Ras Al Khaimah. And of course, even at the ministry, to look at the all of the different uh, Emirates in the UAE. Um, and I think one question came in while you are answering the last question. So, do you think that the the, uh, the building you showed in you showed in your presentations will be saved over the time, especially the those um, that are not owned by the government? Hopefully, I think awareness is uh, increasing in that field, and uh, I think hopefully uh, the ones that require preservation and to be kept will be kept. I mean, I, I was really fascinated that the Safa Park Pavilion was actually was not demolished, and they were just waiting for the restoration, and it's going to be open again. Uh, and having a conversation with the with the like the guy responsible was uh, he kept telling me that it will definitely not be demolished. And he was just so sure about it. And uh, I think most of them will be kept, especially, like, especially the, uh, the buildings that are still used until today, like the shopping malls, the hotels, they are still being used until today. I don't think they are gonna be demolished or anytime soon. Uh, uh, Fatima, I, I have one more question if it's, if it's possible. Uh, you know, I saw, uh, you know, amazing, beautiful photos uh, there that you showed. Uh, is there a specific reason they were not, you know, um, there was no floor plan with that so that at least we could look at typologies? Is it for like, confidentiality? You don't show these plans or something like that? Because, because, you know, it would have been great to see also how as a floor plan or the layout of spaces, maybe we could also grasp a certain type of typologies or something like that. Do you have these doc uh, documented or not? Unfortunately not. I'm actually in the phase of trying to collect them, but it's oh, okay. just so hard to get your hands on them. So okay. uh, I try to put what I have there. I'm not really keeping anything confidential, mm -hmm. but I don't have them. Okay. I wish I do. No, no, but because you know, for us architects, it's very important the floor plan, the sections, all these type of, of elements. So maybe, maybe uh, creating them or adding them or something like this could could uh, could really add to the whole understanding of of the building and their beauty. You know, the the spatial uh, uh, quality that is there that you could see it from the floor plan and sections. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Fatima. I, I would like to end with with two parts. The first part is the the amount of of messages we get uh, of people liking your presentation. And I, I do agree on that amazing presentation, the way I felt I went for, uh, for a visit, a virtual visit to one of the, of the museums. Um, the last question I'll be answering, I'll be answering on your behalf. Uh, will we get the, uh, the, the some, some, um, some, someone is interested in getting some of your information that you shared. So um, I'm sharing with them, you can get the uh, recording uh, uploaded on on youtube and i just shared the screen for the uh, sorry the link for the crid youtube channel and the last question i think apart from your presentation some someone is asking about the painting behind you so uh, <laughs> that's an interesting one yeah so uh and i think we could we could we could end with this thank you so much fatima, fatima uh, you're on mute you're on mute fatima please remove the mute Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you so much, Fatima. We had Fatima <laughs> with us today. Thank you so much for the amazing presentation. And thank you, everyone who joined us. Thank you, uh, Dr. George, for organizing this. And I hope that we will see you again in the next webinar, uh, credit webinar. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you, Fatima. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. See you soon.